Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Charts with Dan. It was a crazy second weekend for the Super Mario Brothers movie. Every time people thought they knew how good it was going to do, those estimates kept going up, and we ended up having the best second weekend for an animated film ever domestically. So we're going to get into all of those numbers, as well as a couple of disappointing debuts and a lesson on why budgets are so important. So there's a lot to go over. One quick programming note. I know that I said this a couple times, but last week was supposed to be the launch of Stream streaming charts with Dan. I had some family business come up, so I was not able to do that last week. It is actually happening this week. I'm also going to be doing a review for Bo is Afraid, and I'm working on a couple of exciting things that I'm hoping to have done either this week or the week after. So stay tuned. I know that I've been doing a lot of programming changes and starting things and not being able to do them for a second time. I promise things are going to stabilize a little bit. It's just one of those things you roll with whatever life throws at you. So having said that, let's look at the box office top 10 for this past weekend, and the Super Mario Brothers movie, a 36.9% drop, which is good for any movie. It is spectacular for a movie that debuted, if you recall, last week. Its three-day opening weekend, which are really days three, four, and five of its release, was about $146 million. So for it to drop 36.9%, from $146 million is incredible. That means that the word of mouth on this movie is good. People are going to see it for a second time. People are getting out there to see it for a first time, maybe even a third, fourth, fifth time. $92.3 million second weekend. Most movies would kill to have that as their opening weekend, and that's been about where we've seen a lot of movies opening. We'll look at those numbers in just a moment. So what was already an incredible debut for the Super Mario Brothers movie just keeps getting better and better with that second weekend number. In second place, doing just about 10% of Super Mario's business is The Pope's Exorcist, starring Russell Crowe, came in just over $9 million, followed by John Wick Chapter 4, a 44.4% drop in its fourth week, and a total just over $8 million. And then at number four is Renfield, which also comes in just over $8 million and ends up in that fourth slot in its debut weekend. And I mentioned that we were going to talk about budgeting. The Pope's Exorcist and Renfield came in about a million dollars apart from each other with The Pope's Exorcist taking second place. The big difference between those two movies, The Pope's Exorcist, cost about $18 million reportedly, whereas Renfield had a $65 million budget. So even though those two movies debuted within about a million dollars of each other, the box office narrative on both of them is drastically different because when you look at the worldwide gross for The Pope's Exorcist with an $18 million budget, it's already doing all right in the theatrical window, whereas Renfield had a very disappointing debut because with $65 million on top of that, you add the promotions and advertising and all all of that stuff, which is probably another 50, 60 million at least, then you're looking at a loss in the theatrical window. We are in a COVID time, which means that the COVID protocols that these movies had to take, keep in mind, we're on about a year to a year and a half lag from production time to release time. So when Renfield was shot, there were some very costly COVID protocols that had to happen. Obviously, the Pope's Exorcist was able to sidestep that. Perhaps it shot later. I haven't really looked at the shooting schedule of the two movies, but Renfield really far too costly for what it was actually bringing in. I think the hope was that Nicolas Cage playing Dracula, perhaps there would be that curiosity factor that didn't really seem to come into play. The reviews weren't fantastic. The word of mouth wasn't fantastic. And so Renfield, not a very impressive debut. We'll see how it does in its second week, but it's not looking like it'll hold well. One of those things where it's able to kind of overcome a slow start by holding on in the theatrical window. I don't necessarily see that happening with Renfield. In fifth place, 45.6. 7% drop in its second week is Air with $7.8 million. That's another movie where in a vacuum that performance is okay given the kind of movie that it is, but also when you look at the costs involved, $90 million, that's largely because Matt Damon and Ben Affleck's production company is all about, and this is great, making sure people are getting paid what they're worth. Something else that I don't know if I mentioned last week is that Air was originally going to be a streaming release, and something that a lot of studios do and that Amazon apparently did in this case is that because you're not going to get that back end revenue from a potential theatrical release, they'll pay out what would be the back end. You just pay that up front because there is going to be no box office, but then there was box office. So Air is a very expensive film, budget, plus you add marketing, plus the acquisition costs for that thing. Amazon is going to lose a lot of money, at least when it comes to exhibition with Air. And then the real calculus is, well, how do they determine 
what it's worth is. Is it subscriptions to Amazon Prime? Is it exposure? Is it awards attention? We don't really know, but the money is not there, even though I thought it was a really good movie, and it's doing all right for an R-rated adult-skewing drama. It's just really, really expensive. In sixth place is Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves. Everything I said about Air pretty much applies to that film as well. A 45.8% drop and a total just over $7.5 million. Suzume is at number seven, debuts at just over $5 million. The worldwide phenomenon finally hits domestic marketplace. We'll look at Suzume's box office performance in a little bit. Tony Collette's Mafia Mama is in eighth place with a total of just over $2 million. Scream 6 still in the top 10, a 56.8% drop in its sixth week and a total at just over $1.4 million. At number 10 is a movie called Nefarious, which I'd actually never heard of before. It's from the writers behind the God's Not Dead movies. Uh, they also directed the abortion film Unplanned, and apparently it is a faith-based exorcism prison drama thriller. So I, I didn't even see any trailers for this movie. It was obviously a word of mouth hit, but this one does kind of go into the faith-based category. From what I was reading in different summaries, it's about a guy who's going to be executed on death row, and he says that he has a demon inside of him, but then he's also an atheist, and it's a lot of actually just kind of talking about religious things. But you wouldn't know it from looking at the poster or the premise of the film, so kind of a sneaky faith-based movie there, rounding out the top 10. A bunch of new movies means that a lot of movies dropped out of the top 10 this past weekend. Creed 3 drops out after six weeks. Shazam! Fury of the Gods, really just kind of a walk of shame at this point, out of the top 10 after four weeks. His Only Son and 1001 both exit after two weeks in the top 10, and Owen Wilson's Paint exits after one week in the top 10. And when we look at the road to recovery, so this is basically the box office pre-pandemic, the box office for the first couple years after theaters were open, and then this year's performance. That dotted black line is how we're doing this year. You see for a second consecutive week, we are doing better than the average from 2015 to 2019, so the five years preceding the pandemic, and of course, far better than that red line there, which is the average of 2021 and 2022. The top performer from that 2015 through 2019 window was the debut of The Fate of the Furious a few years ago. The top performer from the past couple years was Fantastic Beasts, The Secrets of Dumbledore, which debuted on this weekend one year ago, so obviously a, a much better story and a much bigger story for Super Mario Brothers, even in its second weekend, than we saw with The Secrets of Dumbledore and now the Harry Potter franchise apparently going back to formula to the original books. I, I, you know, I guess that's for the streaming show. Anyway, something I'm not really a fan of, but I am a fan of how the box office is doing this year. We were doing really well, kind of charting our course between the averages from these last two uh, windows, areas of time, and then these last couple weeks, we've done really, really well, and we'll see how we continue to do as we go into the summer movie season, which is just a couple of weeks away. That's so hard to believe. Looking at the overall three-day weekend grosses for the year, so this is whether it's the opening weekend for a movie or not, you see that the opening weekend of the Super Mario Brothers movie had the best performance of any film over the Friday through Sunday span this year. Last week's $146.3 million performance is tops there. Then we had the opening weekend of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, $106 million in its opening weekend. And then you see that the second weekend, this past weekend with the Super Mario Brothers movie, is the third best three-day weekend of the year, $92.3 million, meaning it outperformed every other movie except for the opening of the Super Mario Brothers movie and the opening of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania so far this year. Then we have the opening weekend of John Wick Chapter 4 at number 4 with $73.8 million, and the opening weekend of Creed 3 in fifth place with $58.3 million. So here we have even more evidence of just how well the Super Mario Brothers movie is performing. It's posted two of the top three three-day performances of the year domestically, and it's not just confined to the domestic marketplace. When we look at the top five films internationally for this past weekend, this is all markets outside of the U.S. and Canada, the Super Mario Brothers movie hanging on incredibly well there. $94.1 million, obviously an easy first place. John Wick Chapter 4 is in second place with $18.6 million. Dungeon 
Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves in third place with 13.8 million, Suzume bringing in 13 million outside the domestic marketplace, and then the Pope's Exorcist in fifth place at 10.4 million. It got a jump on a lot of these international markets last weekend. When you take those domestic numbers, you add them to the international numbers, we get our top five films worldwide. And this is just crazy numbers here with the Super Mario Brothers movie. It pocketed another $186.4 million just over the three-day weekend worldwide in its second weekend of release. Again, just about any movie would kill to have this as their opening weekend number. And we have the Super Mario Brothers movie doing that. Of course, we're going to get to all the totals worldwide and domestic in just a bit. John Wick Chapter 4, the second highest grossing movie worldwide at $26.6 million, followed by Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves with another $21.3 million, The Pope's Exorcist in fourth place worldwide with $19.4 million, and Suzume at number five with just over $18 million worldwide. And much like we saw domestically, when you look Look at the overall weekend grosses for 2023 worldwide, meaning whether movies opening or not. The top weekend of the year goes to the opening weekend of the Super Mario Brothers movie last weekend at $319.1 million. Then the opening weekend of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, which brought in $227.4 million. And then we have this second weekend of the Super Mario Brothers movie in third place with $186.4 million. So again, much like the case domestically, two of the top three highest performing weekends of the year worldwide go to the Super Mario Brothers movie. Just over that span alone, those two three-day windows, it pocketed about half a billion dollars. That does not count all of the weekday revenue that it's also pocketed. Avatar The Way of Water there in fourth place with $178.4 million and Full River Red in its second week of release, $144.3 million in fifth place. So as it did last weekend, the Super Mario Brothers movie also set a number of marks at the overall box office and in the box office record books. So let's look at a few of those. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, it was the highest second weekend gross for an animated film domestically, $92.3 million. It bests Frozen 2, which had $85.9 million in its second weekend taking advantage of the holiday thanksgiving people being off incredibles 2 is bumped down to third with 80.3 million finding dory bumped down to fourth with 72.6 million and then shrek 2 which if you adjusted for inflation would probably easily top this chart but unadjusted for inflation shrek 2 drops down to fifth place with 72.1 million dollars and again when you look at these other films you have holiday films you have summer films you don't quite have a movie like the super mario brothers movie as far as playing in the spring. Yes, I know that some schools were out for Passover, for Easter, for spring break, etc., but that's not quite the same as everybody being out for the holidays or all the schools being out for the summer. This is just how well the Mario Brothers movie is doing. It is basically defying the seasonal limitations that other movies have had in the past. The Super Mario Brothers movie is now also the highest grossing video game adaptation movie domestically, and it's not even close. 353.1 million dollars total domestic is what the Mario Brothers movie is sitting at right now. It is going to more than double up the previous record, which was set by Sonic the Hedgehog 2 at $190.8 million. So it's now the second highest grossing video game adaptation of all time. The first Sonic the Hedgehog movie drops down to number three at $148.9 million. Uncharted dropping down to number four at $148.6 million. And Pokemon Detective Pikachu now number five at $144.9 1 million. I did do the figures to adjust for inflation, by the way. They were largely the same. The Super Mario Brothers movie is still number one. It would have bested Lara Croft Tomb Raider, which made about 223-ish million dollars adjusted for inflation. So even adjusted for inflation, by about 130 million dollars, the Super Mario Brothers movie is still number one. It is also the highest grossing video game movie of all time worldwide at this point. It has grossed nearly 700 million dollars at the worldwide box box office 692.9 million by the time you watch this it'll be well over 700 million dollars worldwide easily besting the second place film which is Pokemon Detective Pikachu there has been if you look at these different totals here from two to four there are different totals different places some people say it's Warcraft some people say it's Pokemon Detective Pikachu in second place my numbers say Pokemon Detective Pikachu 449.7 million dollars followed by Warcraft with 439 million dollars people might be shocked because they'd say well wait Warcraft was a huge flop it was here domestically but it did really well internationally 
internationally, especially in the Chinese market, and that got it to over $435 million worldwide. In fourth place is Dwayne The Rock Johnson's Rampage with just over $428 million, and in fifth place, Sonic the Hedgehog 2 with just over $400 million, so it seemed like there was like a ceiling around $450 to $400 million. Well, Super Mario Brothers has shattered that ceiling like a block. It, the coins are spilling out. Uh, this is going to be, I think, fairly easily a billion dollar movie, and then we're going to see where it goes from here. I've been doing something on the show recently called a franchise tracker, and I started one. I guess it would be more of a brand tracker, but I'm going to keep saying franchise tracker just to keep the naming consistent. A franchise tracker for the Illumination Entertainment Universe. And when we look at it by domestic gross, we can see that after just under two weeks in release, the Super Mario Brothers movie is now the fourth highest grossing film in Illumination Entertainment history. It will become the highest grossing film in Illumination Entertainment history probably today because it's only about $16 million behind Minions The Rise of Gru, which became the highest grossing film in Illumination's history last summer. The Secret Life of Pets is at number two, Despicable Me 2 is at number three, and then 2015's Minions rounds out the top five. When you adjust for inflation, the Super Mario Brothers movie doesn't drop down that much. It only drops down to number five. Minions The Rise of Gru drops down to number four with $381.2 million. Then we have 2015's Minions with four hundred twenty. dollars $7.9 million adjusted. The Secret Life of Pets up there at $463.2 million adjusted. And Despicable Me 2 with $476.8 million adjusted. I see nothing in the future to me that says that the Super Mario Brothers movie is not going to become the highest grossing film in Illumination's history, even adjusted for inflation. I think it's going to reach that $476.8 million mark easily, unless it really just hits the brakes, which I don't see happening. And then when we look at Illumination by Worldwide Gross, Super Mario Brothers drops down a little bit more. It's at number six right now, with that total just under $700 million. The top five are The Secret Life of Pets with $885.3 million, Minions The Rise of Gru with $939.1 million, Despicable Me 2 with $975.2 million, then Despicable Me 3 from 2017 at just over a billion dollars, and then 2015's Minions at $1.1 billion. And the main question I think here is, I've already said, I think that the Super Mario Brothers movie is going to be a billion dollar grosser worldwide. Does it outdo 2015's Minions to become the highest grossing Illumination film of all time worldwide and basically holding that title across the domestic and worldwide marketplaces? Well, I said last week that if it legs out like Minions The Rise of Gru did, then it should reach that number around $1.2 billion. And right now it's legging out even better than Minions The Rise of Gru. So if it stays on the same trajectory, yes, it will become the highest grossing Illumination film of all time worldwide. The only thing standing in its way, we've got Guardians of the Galaxy 3 coming out in a couple weeks. We have the summer movie season starting very shortly. If that puts the brakes on just enough for the Super Mario Brothers movie, then it could fall short, but if it stays on this current path, then it should blow through all of these numbers. We have so much more to get to, but before we do, I'm going to thank one of the sponsors this week, Athletic Greens, the makers of AG1. AG1 has been a mainstay on the channel, and it's because it's something that I use just about every day. It was hard for me to get into the routine of taking daily supplements, but eating breakfast is something that I start off every morning with, and when I take AG1 with my breakfast shake, it helps make me feel like I'm covering my nutritional bases and starting my day off right. It gives my body so many of the different things that it needs, and that's what it was designed to do, to help you live easier and better without having having to change a whole lot about your routines. It's just one scoop of powder mixed with water once a day, or if you want to throw it into a shake or something like that, it goes down easy, and it helps you to live your best life. For every purchase, Athletic Greens donates to organizations helping to get nutritious food to kids in need, including No Kid Hungry right here in the U.S., in 2020 alone, Athletic Greens donated over 1.2 million meals. If you're looking for an easier way to take supplements, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Just go to athleticgreens.com Dan. That's athleticgreens.com Dan, D-A-N, to check it out. Speaking of its current path, last week I started an estimate of just how much money the Super Mario Brothers movie is making. So looking at where we stand right now, you get a 20% share of the box office cut from China. It's made $15.6 million in China. Not a big deal there, but it still has to open in South Korea and Japan, which should be pretty big markets for the film. 
it's bringing in $3.1 million back to investors from China. $314.5 million made in the international market. $125.8 million of that's coming back to investors, a 40% share of that gross. We had a 60% share of the domestic week one gross of $204.6 million. That comes in at $122.7 million. Then we had a domestic week two share of $148.5 million. Assuming that the studios give back just a little bit of that to the theaters in week two, let's say that the studio cut is a little bit less on that. Let's say 55% of that gross is going back to the investors. That's another $81.6 million. So let's add all these numbers up. The budget for the film is reported at $100 million. Prints and advertising I have at $125 million, which is about right for a movie of its size. I've seen estimates that are lower, but until I see a different number, I'm going to estimate it at $125. That puts a total cost for the Super Mario Brothers movie at $225 million. When you add up all of that estimated income from the different markets, that comes in at about $333.4 million. When you offset that versus the $225 million cost, then by my estimates, the Super Mario Brothers movie has already turned in a profit in the theatrical window alone of over $100 million, keeping in mind this does not include merchandising, this does not include any kind of revenue from licensing the film for streaming, even if you're getting it from the same company, which I don't think should count, that's kind of how it works, or different pay TV windows, etc. This movie, as I mentioned last week, is going to be a license to print money, and according to my estimates, it's already printing nine figures worth of money, and there's no sign that it's gonna stop. It could be turning into two, $300 million very easily. So this is something I'm going to keep tracking. But yeah, this movie very much in the black already. And it's just going to keep running those totals higher and higher. Let's catch up on some info from a few of the other movies in the top 10. First of all, John Wick Chapter 4, buried under all of this Mario news, a pretty momentous event for John Wick Chapter 4. It's now the highest grossing film in the franchise worldwide at just under $350 million. It passes John Wick Chapter 3, Parabellum, in that regard. So that is great news for John Wick Chapter 4 as it continues its box office journey. Then we have Scream. Worldwide grosses for Scream 6 have now bypassed those of Scream 3, so it is now only about $6 million away from overtaking 1996's Scream as the highest grossing film worldwide in that franchise. And I think we're going to see an update on the show here next week reflecting that. So we have John Wick Chapter 4 becoming the highest grossing film worldwide in that franchise. We have Scream 6 on the threshold of becoming the highest grossing film worldwide in that franchise. Creed 3 has become the highest grossing film worldwide. And then we have perhaps the Super Mario Brothers movie becoming the highest grossing Illumination film of all time, definitely domestically, and perhaps Perhaps worldwide as well. This has been a good start for franchises. Well, not all franchises, but a lot of franchises in 2023 and a real resurgent year as far as the overall box office. This is what studios want to see. We've had a great first third of the year just about coming up to the end of it, although a lot of them I think are very nervous about the summer, how many people are going to be going to see these movies, and the fact that so many of these movies are prohibitively expensive. I'm not just talking about things like Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Fast X has reportedly a monstrous price tag over 300 million dollars it's gonna have to do some serious business to make that money back like almost avatar like numbers that's going to be an interesting thing to track this summer is a lot of these movies have done well in the first part of the year that doesn't necessarily mean though that all the summer movies are going to do well and there's going to be a lot of very interesting things to track as we get into that summer movie season Another film I wanted to recognize, not part of a franchise, but part of a director's filmography, is Suzume from director Makoto Shinkai. He's had some really big success in the last few years with his films, and when we look at the highest grossing anime films of all time worldwide, it may not have blown the doors off the box office here domestically, but Suzume is one of the four highest grossing anime films of all time. Number five is One Piece Film Red with $187.1 million. Then we have Suzume, now at number four with $289.1 million. 
At number three is Makoto Shinkai's last film, Your Name, at $382.2 million, then Spirited Away with $383.8 million, and number one by a rather large margin, the highest grossing film worldwide in the year 2020, Demon Slayer the movie, Mugen Train, with just over $500 million worldwide. But when you look at that top five, other than Spirited Away, all of those films have come out in the last five to seven years, which means that anime is starting to break through not just in Japan, but worldwide worldwide on a scale that we have not seen before. I think that streaming is a big reason why people can watch shows like Demon Slayer or they can catch up on movies uh, like uh, Your Name or you have something like Crunchyroll which is here for distribution domestically. You have so many expanded avenues for people to get into anime that people are showing up in bigger and bigger numbers. It's certainly something that I've gotten a lot more into in the last two to three years and I actually went to see Suzume this past weekend. I saw it the day before yesterday on Sunday, and I didn't have time to do a review for it, but I thought it was a beautiful film, and I was so happy that I saw it on a big screen and that it was available to see on a big screen outside of just the major cities. I happened to see it in a major city. I was on the road in LA, but it was also playing right here in my hometown, and that's so great to see. It really is a beautiful film. It's got a really, really good story, a lot of emotion. You probably, if you've seen his other films, shouldn't be too surprised by that, uh, but if you want to see some great Great feature animation. Check out Suzume because it's a really strong movie. Well, the Super Mario Brothers movie wasn't the only one that was putting up really impressive box office totals this past weekend because when we look at the per theater averages for April 14th through the 16th, Bo is Afraid playing in four theaters just over $80,000 per theater. Now, some of you may be saying, what the hell is Bo is Afraid? It's the latest film from Ari Aster, who made one of my favorite movies of all time, which you know if you've seen five seconds of this channel, Hereditary. He also did Midsommar. So this is his third film. I actually also got a chance to see this when I was in LA as well. I saw it in IMAX because it is shot in IMAX and available in select markets. And there will be a review for the film later this week. So I'm not going to give my full thoughts right here, but I will say it is definitely a conversation starter. And you're going to hear a lot of people talking about this film uh, that are going to see it. It's going to be expanding into more theaters this upcoming week. So if you haven't seen Bo is Afraid, if you weren't near one of those four theaters, don't worry. You're probably going to be near one uh, very soon. But it is three hours long, and it is uh, uh, really quite something. Um, so stay tuned here on the channel. Later this week, I'll have my full review of that. In second place was the Super Mario Brothers movie, still bringing in an impressive $21,127 per theater in each of its over 4,300 theaters. It actually expanded its theater count in Weekend 2. This was kind of weird because the movie Wildlife, which is a documentary, I mentioned it briefly last week, I had two different per theater average numbers on it. This one seems to be the official one, just over $20,000. The other one would have actually put it ahead of the Super Mario Brothers movie. So if I need to adjust this, I will. But for right now, just over $20,000 in two theaters. In fourth place is the Norwegian language film Sick of Myself, described as a black comedy. That brought in $10,231 in each of its two theaters, and then still playing in one theater, Joyland, which we talked about last week, $9,194 in one theater. And I guess this shouldn't be surprising, but the Super Mario Brothers movie now owns two of the top five per theater averages for 2023. There it is in second place. Last weekend, it put up $33,701 per theater in each of its 4,343 theaters. Also now the fifth best per theater average of the year with its $21,127 per theater. But Bo is afraid just obliterating this record. This is the kind of thing that you want to see if you're one of these theaters in New York and LA that gets to play one of these films. $80,000 at best, the second place movie by about $50,000 per theater. Of course, it only played in four theaters, but this is what you often see with these big, buzzy, independent films. A lot of times around award season, you'll see a movie do this, everything, ever, all at once. Had a great opening weekend per theater average, and obviously Ari Aster able to bring people in initially to this film. I think there's a big curiosity factor around it. Can that translate now to its expansion coming up this weekend? Third place is Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, bringing in just over $24,000 in its opening weekend. And then The Wandering Earth 2 back in January, which brought in just over $21,000. Looking at the top five films in limited release, meaning films that were in 1,000 theaters or fewer, Nefarious in 933 theaters, good enough for first place, $1.3 million total. Bo is Afraid, despite playing in just four theaters, 
able to come in second place, $320,396 in just four theaters. How to Blow Up a Pipeline had a big expansion, but only a modest increase in box office, $187,265 in its second week, now in 142 theaters. Showing up in 28 theaters is on the chart for a second week at $128,000 and then $1,001 rounding out the top five in its third week, playing in 130 theaters, so it loses a big chunk of its theater count, but still bringing in just over $88,000. When we look at the 10 highest grossing films in limited release this calendar year, meaning all tickets sold no matter when the film is released, Patan remains number one, A Man Called Otto remains at number two for the portion of its release when it was still in limited release, Women Talking is at number three, The Wandering Earth 2 is at number four, and Mummies is at number five. That's all unchanged from last week. The Whale's at number six, 1001 jumps up two spots to number seven with a total of just over $3.3 million. The 2023 Oscar shorts and Living both drop one spot to numbers eight and nine, and then Tujuti Main Makar remains at number 10. And of course, the theaters that are often playing these movies that we're talking about, like Boa's Afraid, are the independent theaters around this great country of ours. And as I've been doing on the show, and I'm going to resume doing this week, I decided to spotlight almost every week one of those theaters around the country. And this week, I'm talking about the Ragtag Cinema, which is a two-screen theater located in Columbia, Missouri. Ragtag Cinema springs from a group that was founded in 1998. They opened their first theater in the year 2000 and became a nonprofit in 2004. Back in 2008, after over $250,000 in community support, they moved to their current home, which is located in an old Coca-Cola bottling plant where the theater projects films on both digital and 35 millimeter. Ragtag Cinema shares space with a record store, a bakery, and an art gallery, so you can pretty much take care of everything right then and there. This week, if you were to visit the theater, you could catch everything everywhere all at once, still on the big screen, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, which we just talked about, and Return to Soul, which has been featured on this show a few times. And tonight, Tuesday night, if you happen to be near Columbia, Missouri, they'll be screening the film Tank Girl, on 35 millimeter as part of a continuing screening series. And they host a lot of these screening series over the course of the year, as well as film festivals and other things like that. If you want to find out more about the Ragtag Cinema, or if you want to donate, because keep in mind they are a nonprofit, you can go to ragtagcinema.org. And if you make a donation to the Ragtag Cinema, or you happen to stop by in Columbia, Missouri, as always, tell them Dan sent you. Much more to come, but before we get to that, I want to thank our other sponsor for this week. Today's episode is sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. Do you ever get that little burst of adrenaline when you find a good deal online? You know, when you're looking for something anyway, and then you find out that you just saved a few bucks or even more? Well, you can get that little thrill every time you shop online with Honey. Forget manually searching for online coupon codes. Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds right to your cart. I was looking at some physical media pre-orders today because, well, you know me, and when I clicked on the Super Mario Brothers movie, Honey let me compare prices across several different stores online and also notified me of some deals if I bought it today. And it's so easy to use. Honey does all the work for you. All you have to do is click and save money. And Honey doesn't just work on desktops, it also works on your iPhone. Just activate it in Safari on your phone and save on the go. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out and by getting it you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this show get paypal honey for free at joinhoney.com slash merle that's joinhoney.com slash merle m-u-r-r-e-l-l Let's look at the 2023 box office totals overall, and we'll start with the domestic winter spring box office, which is all movies released this year after January 1st, 2023. And the Super Mario Brothers movie is now the highest grossing film of the year, $353.1 million. Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania now a distant second with $212.9 million. John Wick Chapter 4 moves up to third place with $160.2 million, dropping Creed 3 down to fourth place with $155. 5.2 million. Scream 6 stays at number 5 with 106.8 million. Megan stays there at number 6. Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves jumps up one spot to number 7. It's at 74.2 million dollars. Cocaine Bear drops down one spot to number 8. And then rounding out the top 10 are Shazam Fury of the Gods and Jesus Revolution, both just over 50 million dollars. 
When we look at the domestic box office this year, as far as calendar gross, meaning all tickets sold since January 1st, we also have a new number one because the Super Mario Brothers movie has now sold the most tickets this year, period. Avatar The Way of Water now drops down to number two with $281.9 million, now about $70 million behind the Super Mario Brothers movie. Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania drops down to number three. John Wick Chapter 4 moves up one spot to number four. Creed 3 moves down one spot to number five. Puss in Boots The Last Wish stays at number six. Scream 6 stays at number seven. So we have so far, if you look at all tickets sold, seven movies thus far in 2023 that have sold $100 million plus worth of tickets. Not too shabby. Megan says, at number eight dungeons and dragons honor among thieves enters this chart at number nine cocaine bear is at number 10 and a man called Otto drops off of the list altogether and when we look at the 2023 worldwide box office the super mario brothers movie also the new champion there 692.9 million dollars now the highest grossing film of the year worldwide with some big markets left to go a three spot jump from last week china's full river red drops down one spot to number two the wandering earth 2 drops down one spot to number three ant-man and the wasp quantum mania drops down one spot to number four with 474.3 million dollars total john mc chapter four jumps up one spot to number five with 349.8 million dollars dropping creed three down one spot to number six with 271.3 million some delayed box office reporting there on john wick chapter four that's why it took such a big jump in just one week booty bears guardian codes at number seven with 221.5 million dollars megan's at number eight Scream 6 is at number 9, and Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves able to break into the top 10 overall worldwide box office at $157.2 million, dropping the Chinese film Hidden Blade out of the top 10 altogether. Before we go, I want to take a look at a weekend in box office history, and we are going to go back 30 years to April 9th through 11th, 1993, the 15th week of the year, which saw the opening of Indecent Proposal, 18.3% million dollars and it's really interesting to see this lineup because it's a bunch of kids movies and then a very very adult movie at number one indecent proposal opening an easy number one over the number two film just a little bit different called the sandlot one of the great childhood classics of my era and it seems to have really translated and stayed alive all these years which makes me very happy 4.9 million dollars in second place in third place was the burt reynolds vehicle cop and a half where it's him he's a cop He's teamed up with a kid. That would be the half cop and, um, you know, cop and a half. Anyway, a 25.2% drop in its second week for a $4.5 million weekend total. At number four, Disney's The Adventures of Huck Finn, which starred Elijah Wood. It dropped 16.5% in its second week for a $4.2 million total. I remember seeing that when I was a kid. I don't remember much about it, but the fact that I don't remember much about it probably says that they left out some of the more, let's say, controversial parts of that novel. And rounding out the top five was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, where they went back in time, 32.8% drop in its fourth week for a $3.1 million total. But as we always do when we do the box office flashback, we don't just want to look at those old figures. We want to see what happens when we adjust for inflation. And when we push that inflation button, we see that Indecent Proposal debuted to an adjusted total of $38.4 million. And that really puts into context just how different it was or how different the times were. I think you'd be hard-pressed to get that kind of a film to open that high nowadays but that's just the kind of market that it was there were fewer movies and you know there were things that the adults wanted to go see too so there you go 38.4 million dollar adjusted opening for indecent proposal the sandlot putting up 10.2 million dollars adjusted in second place cop and a half at 9.4 million dollars in week two the adventures of hug finn at 8.7 million dollars also in week two and teenage mutant ninja turtles 3 in week four at 6.5 million dollars And that pretty much does it for Charts with Dan this week. As I mentioned, the Streaming Charts show will make its debut later this week. I will also have my review of Bo is Afraid, as well as my review of Evil Dead Rise, which is the big wide release happening this weekend. It will be available nationwide alongside another Guy Ritchie film coming about a month after the release of his last film, although it was kind of an unplanned release, 
Guy Ritchie's The Covenant. If you had Guy Ritchie Makes War Drama starring Jake Gyllenhaal on your bingo card for 2023, congratulations, because once again, I did not have that. It opens wide on Friday, along with Chevalier starring Kelvin Harrison Jr. as a French composer, kind of a real-life, ripped-from-history type thing. Also expanding from its very small, limited opening is Bo is Afraid, which will be available in many more theaters around the country. And then opening in more limited release around the country, a few other films perhaps to keep an eye on. To Catch a Killer, starring Shailene Woodley and Ben Mendelsohn. Somewhere in Queens, also opening this weekend, starring and directed by Ray Romano. The documentary Little Richard, I Am Everything will be expanding into more theaters and also available on streaming this upcoming weekend. I was able to see this documentary virtually at Sundance. It's a really, really fascinating look at a musician. If you think you know Little Richard, I can promise you that you do not. Also in limited release, the French film Other People's Children, as well as the Japanese film Plan 75, which Japan submitted as the best international feature submission for the Oscars last year. And finally opening this weekend in limited release, Paul Meskel's follow-up to his Oscar-nominated role in After Sun, Carmen, which is being billed as kind of a riff on the classic opera. It's directed by Benjamin Millipiede, who is a choreographer. It's his feature debut. He also happens to have been married to Natalie Portman for over a decade. The music for the film is from Nicholas Bertel, who is one of my favorite composers out there. Melissa Barrera is also the co-star of that film, so keep an eye out for that kind of a buzzy project there. Of course, there are always other movies that are opening nationwide, so check your local listings and try to see if you can find one near you. And if you see an interesting one, uh, give me a shout because I'm always looking for interesting movie suggestions as well. Thank you so much for tuning in to Charts with Dan this week. Please stay tuned right here on the channel. We've got a lot of stuff coming up. Thank you to Honey and Athletic Greens, my two sponsors this week. You can find more info about both of them in the description below, as well as links to Tornado Relief. We still need money to recover from these horrible tornadoes that happen just over two weeks ago here in Central Arkansas. Uh, so please, 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 if you're able to uh, continue to give to the Arkansas Food Bank as well as some other local relief organizations, you can find those links down there below. But most of all, thank you for spending part of your day with me. I'll be back very soon with more movie news, reviews, box office, and more. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you then. Bye.